All right. Hello, folks. Uh, since many of you heard us chatting before we got started, uh, we'll just jump right in. Um, I'm Catherine DeWitt. I'm the project director for the Broadband Access Initiative at the PQ Charitable Trusts. Um, and I am joined today uh, by uh, two women who I'm thrilled to be sharing this panel with. Um, Mylene Garcia, who is the digital director for the Bloomberg Center for Public Innovations at Johns Hopkins University. She uh, leverages more than 15 years of experience working in cities, digital innovation, and public service to lead the center's digital practice and bring innovative digital solutions to cities around the globe. She is the former head of digital strategy and engagement for the city and county of San Francisco, as well as the architect of the city of Oakland's first digital service team. Her passion for creating innovative and efficient digital solutions that drive social impact has guided her work throughout her career. Dr. Karen Mossberger is the Frank and June Sackton Professor in the School of Public Affairs at Arizona State University and the Director of the Center on Technology, Data, and Society. Her recent Oxford University Press book with Caroline Tolbert and Scott Lacombe, Choosing the Future, Technology and Opportunities in Communities, received the 2022 Goldsmith Book Prize for Best Academic Book from the Schornstein Center at Harvard University. Congratulations, Karen. The book provides evidence on over nearly two decades uh, that inclusive broadband adoption contributes to prosperity and economic opportunity in communities. It also shows what many of us know uh, that wide disparities have persisted in the US from neighborhood down to the county level. As for me, as I mentioned, I lead the broadband uh, access initiative at the Pew Charitable Trusts. Um, I would lead a team of researchers um, and experts who are working with policymakers at every level of government to accelerate efforts to bridge the digital divide. Uh, I've worked uh, at the intersection of technology opportunity and economic renewal for more than a decade um, and bring experience working with policymakers, philanthropists, researchers, the private sector and other advocates um, to this issue as well. Um, prior to joining Pew, I uh, held roles at Booz Allen Hamilton and the Heinz Endowments. So now that bios are uh, out of the way, um, I'm, like I mentioned, so excited uh, to be joined today uh, on this panel. Um, thanks everybody for their flexibility. Unfortunately, Samantha Sharpman is not able to join us, um, but I promise this will be a very robust discussion. Um, so why don't we get started and jump in? Um, I think first, um, we're here to talk about sustainability, sustainability of programs, which, uh, and sustainability of digital equity efforts in general, which may seem a little bit strange given that in the infrastructure bill alone, we're talking about well over $42 billion uh, in federal funding that will be applied uh, towards broadband infrastructure and digital equity initiatives. That 42 billion does not include numbers from uh, other COVID relief bills at the federal level, as well as investments that states and local governments are making on their own. But we need to be thinking ahead um, because this investment, while significant, um, it may help us close the access and infrastructure gap, but we're not going to close the equity gap. And more importantly, um, we will just really be scratching the surface of understanding um, how this access to technology, this ubiquitous access to and use of technology is uh, impacting communities across the country. So we're here to talk about how we make sure that these efforts are sustainable moving forward. Um, but I think before we jump into that, I'd like to take a step back and start with the why. Um, why should state and local government care about making digital equity and related initiatives sustainable with all the other things that they're responsible for focusing on? Why should state and local government care about this? So Karen, you wanna go first? So um, I mentioned the recent book in the bio uh, because it, we have evidence through this research about how important not just broadband infrastructure, but inclusive broadband adoption, broadband use is not only for individuals, but for communities. And it's an argument for why this is really a core responsibility for what government does. Um, it's part of something that governments at all levels need to be paying attention to going forward. So, um, we can see, for example, looking at data that we had 
for um, over two decades using multi-level models to estimate data from the current population survey from the census and adding that to more recent American community survey data. Looking at this long period of time, which really suggests causation, it's important for looking at causation, we can see how the percentage of the population with broadband subscriptions, that is inclusive broadband adoption and use, how that matters for outcomes like measures of prosperity across the 15 largest metros, um, for full employment in the 50 largest metros, and how that, you know, other things like the education, the percentage of millennials, um, you know, uh, tech firms, tech employment, you know, that magnified these effects, but broadband alone mattered. Just looking at broadband subscriptions alone, that was a significant predictor of things like full employment, um, fuller employment and prosperity. We looked at the county level as well, using some different measures of prosperity from the Economic Policy Institute that included things like housing. Uh, it included things like workforce participation, wages, um, business establishments, so outcomes for businesses and also for individual residents. And um, again, broadband subscriptions or broadband adoption mattered for prosperity, for median income in counties. It mattered for urban, for suburban and rural counties. Um, uh, and comparing it to the measures of broadband providers, what we usually use to measure infrastructure or availability of broadband, adoption matters more because people are actually lighting up those networks and using them. So all of this suggests that it's really important to things like economic development, um, promoting economic opportunity, workforce development for residents, things that state and local governments do um, that are you know, part of their core responsibilities. Um, what this really, we argued what this really represents is a measure of digital human capital, um, just like education is human capital and um, governments promote education for economic development and opportunity. Um, this is similar and it's something that we can't just let fade away as um, you know, federal money is spent in the future. It, it has to be sustained. Okay, um, Myling, would you like to jump in? Sure. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Catherine. I, you know, I, I think I think your question is really at, at the heart of like many questions is why do we care about what state and local governments are doing? Why do we care about cities? And I, I think from my standpoint it's really because cities are responsible for the most immediate intimate parts of our lives from streets to schools. Cities are at the front line of government. And similarly, when people are accessing their services, which has really been the focus of my career, um, is, is how constituents access government services, leveraging technology, um, you know, broadband, internet, having access to internet is obviously at the precipice of that. Um, and so a lot of the work uh, with myself and my colleagues at the Bloomberg Center for Public Innovation is really looking at the intersection of that academic work and cutting edge best practice in, in several areas, one of which um, is the practice that I lead, which is the digital practice. Okay. So what I'm hearing from both of you is, um, and also this echoes what uh, the research that we've done with state lawmakers in particular has found is that we're talking about sort of the, um, what that access really means um, and um, for service delivery in communities and then what comes of that access. So when I talk to lawmakers, they immediately say we combat brain drain and really it, Trend, it moves in then to revenue generation. But Karen, taking a step back from that, you know, you're really talking about um, fuller employment, job opportunity, educational opportunity. And then we pivot into the actual service delivery side of government. And, um, you know, how do we really ensure that citizens are getting and accessing those services that their tax dollars are paying for? Okay. So I think that um, 
especially during the pandemic. So digital government has been around for a long time, but one of the barriers for that has been that not everyone's online. So we really haven't been able to realize the full potential of having information and services and civic engagement online through digital government. But I think we saw during the pandemic, um, you know, city council meetings went online, governments had to put more services online. Um, we saw growth in telemedicine, it's more prominent than before. So, you know, um, in, in terms of what Megling just said, um, you know, schools, even now that schools are open, there's a real role for, um, you know, connecting homes and schools through, you um, digital platforms, um, for, you know, students to have internet access for research, for homework, for all kinds of uses. So this is really just a part of all of these things that government does and supports anyway. And it needs to be integrated into budgets for all of these services. It's just a part of what we do. And I think with the pandemic that this digital shift got accelerated and we can really see, I think in, in a lot of places where maybe there hadn't been as much recognition of the potential of technology that we've really seen this with this acceleration of the digital shift. And, and that's persisted, you know, it, things are not going to go back the way that they were before. And with the acceleration of this digital shift, if we don't, um, sustain these digital inclusion efforts, that means that people who are left behind are going to be even more excluded than they were in the past. Um, but we need to find a way to just build this into budgets, into everything that we do to support these digital services too. Well, I was just going to amplify some of those points, Karen. I, you know, I think a couple of things here is that if we tie really the, the why, like why we need this um, to government services, and I'll use this example of San Francisco, a lot of the interest in providing broadband there, which was run through the city's digital equity office, um, was really because kids need to do their homework, right? And, you know, and I think that those are like government services that are being provided and people needed those. And therefore it precipitated a very clear argument for being able to um, have broadband, Wi-Fi and other sort of like instruments to expand reach um, within the city. And, and I think that if we really get to the why we need broadband, whether that's schools, whether that's streetlights, whether that is like paying your parking ticket or a whole host of government city services, then I think that we can really better establish like what funding streams can tackle that. And I'll use the example that came out of the 80s. Um, I don't know if people remember the cable franchise agreements. Um, and those cable franchise agreements really, you know, were set up um, to establish public um, access television stations in cities around the globe, around the country, not the globe, but at least in the United States. And, and, I, and I think that one of the things that is so foundational and fundamental is it is a response to a new technology, which was television, right? Television was widely disseminated at that time um, around the country. And therefore the response was, is that we needed to reach people and people needed to have access to their governments through this new piece of equipment that everybody had, which was a TV. And now that piece of equipment is shifted to computers, right? And so the question is, how do we then pivot some of our mechanisms in which we're reaching um, constituents through? So it's not just that we're like watching, right? Um, a council meeting as it's happening. We're watching, you know, sort of that programming uh, that happens and that kind of snowy screen, right? Everybody knows what that channel is, I think. Uh, but how are we actually pivoting to sort of like more modern ways of thinking through what that reach looks like as we've moved away from the television box to things that are more analogous with Wi-Fi and our computer screens? Mm -hmm. I think this element of digital transformation is a really important one um, and important for a few reasons. First, it, it I think is... Um, uh, transformation is the appropriate word. Um, this is a, we are talking about a fundamental shift in the way that we think about delivering services, about the, to your point, it's not just enough to put something up online. It's not enough just to like 
run the meeting and have an online access, but how do you make sure that folks can engage with that? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that the other component of this, particularly when we're thinking about things like access to healthcare and education, this also brings up other questions around um, things like regulation and privacy that you know, we are in some ways, not, not that the, um, the individual fields of healthcare, education, workforce development, they are not scratching the surface of this. They have been thinking about these issues for quite some time. But what we really need to do is build that bridge between folks who work in digital equity, who work in government service delivery, and those um, other fields, other industries who have been thinking about some of these really complex questions. How do we then bring these two perspectives together to think about that full, fully, um, uh, sorry, there's a word here that I'm missing, but it's like that 360 degrees of engagement um, that it's it's participatory and it's, it's two ways of communication from citizen to government, government back to citizen. Um, so how is that transformation going? Um, you know, just for the however many tens of thousands of communities there are across this country. But, you know, generally, I mean, when we are talking about the um, point of sustainability and how we get to sustainability, it is seeing that digital transformation through. So how, um, Miley, I'd be really curious to hear what your perspective is in working with cities. Um, what does that look like and how's progress? Um, I, I think that's I think that's a great question. I, I mean, I would be really interested. In, I mean, I, I could think of a million ways that what it could look like. I, I think what it looks like now, just in terms of digital transformation, is there's a really specific focus on developing products and processes um, that have benefited from you know technological interventions. So whether that's apps for reporting problems, if that is uh, better ways to sort of connect with your police department. Um, to get their attention, if, you know, if that is uh, looking at data, understanding council decisions, those things have lent itself to higher degrees of, I think, transparency as a result of technology. I, I think the thing that sort of not happened at the other end of that is really sort of like matching the developments of those products to the access and availability of the constituents um, in a given network. And, you know, that doesn't necessarily need to be people that have, you know, Wi-Fi. I, th I think I think people, you know, often think of uh, just access as sort of a don't have access, do have access, but where as opposed to there's really a spectrum of access. People have older equipment. People have, you know, good access to internet not so great access to internet. Everybody's has a, had a dropped Zoom call, right? Like, so not everybody has, you know, the ability to get on these things and thereby the products that we're actually developing really need to meet the moments at which our constituents are actually arriving at the quote unquote, like digital front doors. And so, you know, I, I think that that's where we're at. I think that it's sort of a mixed, mixed bag. We're doing a lot of, I think, digital transformation research on the experiences of people that are on platforms, but I don't know that we're necessarily doing enough to understand the, you know, peripheral lanes of the people that we're not reaching that we could be reaching if we adjusted some of our roadmaps um, and features and functions accordingly. And I think that going back to just the, the core of this panel, it's really about how do we like fund the, you know, how do we sort of sustain the funding around these initiatives? And for me, it's really, again, sort of like going back to the why. If we know that we're doing this to ensure, you know, access for government services, whatever those government services may be, then we have to meet constituents in the moment, given the sort of access that we're providing. I mean, I, I think it's also about looking ahead too. I, yeah. I think you're exactly right about tech. I like how you said tech needs uh, tech needs to meet the needs and the moments, and we need to adjust accordingly. Mm -hmm. And it's striking this balance of you know using these in, these advancements to really improve in, improve lives now, but also planning ahead. Um, and that's where I, I think sustainability in particular um, gets gets sticky. And I. I I will let Karen jump in because you came off mute. So I assume you want to add something. So, <laughs> well, I was just going to say those are all great examples. And so um, these innovations are, 
you know, the, the goal behind these kinds of digital innovations is usually to deliver more effective services, to, um, you know, be more efficient, to save on costs to the extent that, you know, some neighborhoods are left out, you know, on, on an app that collects data on, on um, problems on streets or that, um, you're not going to realize that more effective service to the extent that you still need to have multiple channels to deliver services, not only digitally, but you still rely a lot on in-person and phone. I mean, there's always going to be a role for that, but to the extent that for things like social service delivery, that's needed heavily for transactions that could be easily done with a few clicks and, and would be more convenient for users to the extent that, you know, we don't have inclusive broadband use, we can't really realize these benefits of efficiency or cost savings. So if, you know, if communities need to invest even through their own budgets, um, if they need to go out to look for partnerships with industry, with nonprofits, to get foundation funding, but you know, even to invest their own money that they use for service delivery. In the long run, this can save money. In the long run, it may lead to more effective services for everyone in the community. So I think um, there's a tendency to think about digital inclusion as a cost. It's not just a cost, it's an investment in what we can do in the future, how we can innovate. I, I was just going to amplify this point. This is actually something I, I, I feel like I, I might I might be getting on a little bit of a soapbox for a moment. But, you know, I, I, I think that there's always this, you know, especially when you're talking about technology, right? Technology, a lot of the um, utility of it is measured with private sector metrics. Right. And that is really to acquire as many users as you can at the lowest cost. And I think, you know, Karen, the thing that I'm hearing you highlight is really the fact that actually, in actuality, the acquisition of the most difficult users is going to be quite expensive. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's bad. And it's because governments are not businesses. And that's often said in a sort of like negative context. But it's because governments, especially local governments, their scope is much bigger. They're not just looking at sort of acquiring somebody for like, you know, a short term attendance at a council meeting or, you know, a community event. They're looking at the longevity, the sort of like long term well being of the resident, right? And so if that, in fact, is the measurement, then really looking at these like short term metrics that I think a lot of times that we are pushing in yeah. the realm of technology is a little bit short sighted and I think loses some of the value of that investment that you're talking about. Like we, I, I don't know that we've necessarily found a way to adequately communicate that yet. I would like to join you on this soapbox, uh, but I do want to come back to this question on measurement uh, and uh, how it relates to sustainability, because I, I really want to dig into that point. I do think that you bring up an excellent point, and Karen and I are both like bobbleheading along with you as you're making it, because um, the government is not business, and to connect the least connected to ensure that those who are least likely to have affordable access to be able to use it, to your point, those are going to be the most expensive households and individuals to serve. That is why we need this investment that we are making right now through the B program, through the capital projects funds. We need to make that capital investment in order to defray long-term costs. Um, so I, I, I am curious what y'all think about, as we are thinking about sustainability of these initiatives, how do we sort of strike that balance in um, recognizing that we are going, we need to make these significant investments in infrastructure that, but there will be ongoing costs. So how do we think about those ongoing costs? Um, you know, is this something where we uh, embed it as we've, as we've all suggested, and I think this is completely logical, you embed it in the general operating budget of agencies, because this is just how we do business now. Um, or is it something different? Do you retain a structure that many state and local governments have right now where there is a separate office for digital equity and inclusion? Um, 
Is it a both? So I'm going to put this out to both of you. How are we really defining sustainability here? For maintenance of the initiatives that we are building to, not just the building of a network. So I, I would just say, I think there's a role for these offices in terms of coordination and assistance and information, but I would hate to see all of the activities, um, you know, around digital inclusion just assigned to that one office. I think they need to be integrated into, you know, all of these different agencies. Um, um, you know, I think one of the things that the um, federal legislation makes clear is that these investments are supposed to assist with jobs and economic development, with health and with education that's prioritized. I think that's how we need to think about this, not just something in the technology office or a digital, it's not just um, the chief information officer's job or a digital equity task force job. They're there to help with this, but it's something that's spread and integrated all across government for service delivery, for information, for small business development, for workforce development. And I think, you know, should be built into all of those budgets so that it doesn't look like it's some kind of standalone extra. Um, this is a part of, you know, the way we live today and how government is, is coping with that, adapting to that. I think I, I would just also add, like, I think my my inner bureaucrat is hearing my colleagues that are leading departments thinking, oh, my God, where am I going to find a piece of my budget right. to give up to upgrade to, you know, to sort of address these things? I, I, I could probably see them say, yes, I agree. But secretly, I'm very afraid, like, <laughs> like what that will actually mean in terms of any service provision let alone uh, those that are that are digital in nature. And, and I think, you know, one of the reasons why I mentioned the cable franchise fee at the, the very beginning, I think, of, of our chat is because, you know, I think if I remember correctly, the way that it's set up is that you have about 5% of gross revenues levied in a particular year for a particular city to fund some of these efforts around public access television. So the question that I have, you know, is not just where we can sort of like take away within cities, but where are these places where the city is actually giving giving resources right to people maybe outside of the public where the city is actually not benefiting from it right whether that's public land whether that's infrastructure whether that is you know sort of administrative oversight of permits and roads and installation and where are there places in which they can recoup some of those costs um, in order to be reinvested um, for some of these efforts and initiatives and so um, I don't know that I necessarily have the answers. I feel like that there are probably some amazing colleagues that I have in cities um, and local governments across the country that can say, oh, well, you know, we don't get money for fill in the blank. And I think that that's probably where a lot of our answers lie in, in, in bridging that connection. Yeah, I agree. And um, really excited because you touched on a lot of very wonky details in there that I would like to unpack for just a mere moment. Um, I think your point on revenue generation is very important. How do you find a source of revenue so you are not taking from um, institutions that are already in many ways resource, resource and cash strapped? I apologize. I'm in the flight path of uh, the helicopters for the White House. So, uh, and that sounds much more fancy than it actually is live close to the river. Anyway, so they're very loud. So I apologize. Um, anyway, uh, so there's this point of how do we pay for this? And we've seen several states re, uh, repurpose their high cost, um, their universal service telephone uh, funds in order to pay for broadband deployment. Um, Colorado is one of those states. The problem is that those, um, those um, funds are funded by taxes on landlines, which fewer and fewer Americans are using these days. So we need to be thinking about other sources for how can we how can we generate um, consistent and predictable sources of revenue so that way programs can plan accordingly? It doesn't become a burden. It becomes part of your standard annual budgeting process. I think the other point um, 
is really about the transition and how we view internet access. And where even when I started working specifically on internet, internet access about a decade ago, um, when the Recovery Act funds were being distributed, you know, there was still a lot of discussion about whether internet access was a luxury or a necessity. And um, that's that concept of, is this a luxury or is it an essential good? Is it a necessity? I'm not even gonna get into the utilities piece, that has really framed policy and how we structure policy, how we fund this, the funding requirements we attach to policy. That perspective has shaped broadband funding until now. And the biggest, and I think, uh, I think one of the most important things uh, in the broadband budget, in the, excuse me, in the infrastructure bill um, that we, we as those who are practitioners, observers, um, and partners to uh, the states and local governments implementing these funds, the difference is that what you see in the funding requirements outlined in the legislation, as well as what NTIA has outlined in its notice of funding opportunity, are steps to ensure that, or is that the government is now viewing this as an essential service. Everybody needs to have this. This isn't, this isn't a luxury. And we are talking about building floors, not ceilings for these networks and for their capabilities. We are talking about ensuring that affordability is an inextricable part of these network builds. That is a huge, huge step forward and suggests that we are at this point now where we have made some sort of social pact agreeing that internet access is essential. And so the government needs to take a very forward leaning role in ensuring that everybody has access to it. Now it's on the rest of us to think about sustainability and ensuring all of the outcomes that Karen was talking about earlier um, and that, well, that both of you have been talking about, sorry, I'm thinking about academic measurement. Uh, now it's on all of us to ensure that moving forward. So I will stop rambling. And do either of you have anything that you would like to add to that? Otherwise I'm gonna to pivot to measurement. Karen. So oh, actually, I just wanted to mention, we've been talking a lot about local governments and I think that local governments obviously are responsible for a lot of these services that touch people's lives. And so that's, you know, um, and local governments have the knowledge of what's needed in their communities. Um, uh, but also one of the issues that comes up is sometimes the local governments that have the highest need also have the fewest resources to address right. that need. That's true in, um, uh, in urban communities. It's true in small rural uh, local governments that you know, may not have very big budgets or very many people working for them. So I think there's a role for states too going forward, uh, obviously, you know, for the federal government, but I think that states need to think about not only just um, the digital equity planning that they're doing around this IIJA money, and then, you know, um, I think they need to, uh, going forward, figure out how to provide support for those communities with the highest needs and the fewest resources to help. Um, uh, just the same way that, you know, many states support education and, you know, uh, local governments mm -hmm. to, um, it, again, it's digital human capital and, and it's necessary for functioning society. So I think there is a role for both states and local governments in this going forward too. You are not going to get any fights from me on the role of state government when it comes to broadband uh, and digital equity. And I think that your point about equipping local leaders is so important and one that we don't talk about enough uh, really right now in the context of IIJA implementation, but it was also something that we found in our research that folks like both of you have been saying forever, but we heard echoed in um, state broadband practitioners was even if they didn't have money for a broadband grant program, which many states didn't, even those who continued their efforts after uh, the Recovery Act ended, 
Um, but what they did do was focus on training their local leaders. Um, they repurposed capacity building and those local education initiatives on things like infrastructure, um, water, sewer in general. They repurposed that and adapted it into broadband training and digital equity training. Um, and so they were able to help those local leaders apply for federal funds, um, secure private investments. And that um, education and training help the states move forward um, and prepare for federal funds when they did become available. Um, but we don't talk enough about those great examples of where the states are thinking about how do we support our communities um, in this moment? How do we make sure that they, those particularly those that are least likely to access those resources um, and have those resources, how do we make sure they actually get them in place? My link, anything on the local um, leader piece? I, you know, I, I think generally speaking, you know, I, I would say that probably a, like a, a not explicit, um, subtle sort of mission of mine, I think, is to give local leaders the tools to talk about these issues. I think that there isn't enough of an understanding, both just from a policy perspective. Certainly people work in technology policy, and that typically happens at the federal or national level. Um, but really not at the local level. And it's, it, I think that there's an incongruence there because a lot of the execution and implementation is actually there. Um, and so that's, that's really, I, I, I would say, just sort of a really explicit uh, moonshot, I think for me, is to really equip a lot of local leaders to better converse and to under, understand like where these points are. Um, that they can better advocate for their cities, I think, to the point made about having few resources and for the most sort of the highest need. Um, so how do we, you know, aid that disproportionate or balance that disproportionate investment is really going to be key through these local leaders who, you know, to no fault of their own, I think have a, have a really steep learning curve for something that is actually rapidly changing, right? Like it's not something that there is a college program out there uh, about, there is not sort of a, you know, a place for you as a, you know, local council member to like learn about decades of policy. And then as soon as you learn it, it's so rapidly changing because the technology is also changing around it. So that policy process also doesn't necessarily keep up with the flow at which, and the pace at which technology has been evolving. Yes, um, all, all true for many, uh, many reasons. Um, Karen, as the, uh, as the professor on the line, anything to add on the education and training piece? Um, so I, I think that the more that we build in discussions about this in class, um, we need to do more in education and training around digital governance anyway. Um, but this is a part of that discussion and it should be part and parcel of that. Um, I think actually um, I'm working with uh, ASU, my center is working with the Marconi Society on um, a certificate program, a training program um, that we hope to roll out next year, um, where we will be offering people who are great managers who've gotten tasked with this, but don't know much about the policy area, don't know much about digital inclusion or broadband infrastructure and introduction to some of these issues. But, you know, part of this is, as Mei Ling said, that this is always changing. So part of this is for policymakers to um, also know where to go to look for information um, over time. Um, what are some of the organizations, just, just um, the same way that state and local government officials always turn to professional associations to stay, um, to stay uh, current with what's happening in their profession. I think, um, I, I think those state and professional associations have a role to play also. Uh, again, as we look at how this is just integrated into everything that we do, um, you know, 
digital inclusion, the resources for this, this should be part of these professional networks. And, um, you know, it's, it's important for people to find out how they keep learning about this and stay up, uh, stay current with developments because there is this rapid evolution. Agreed. I mean, integration, indoctrination in the ways of digital equity and thinking about how it it, work, it rolls into governance. Um, that was a joke, by the way. Um, the Yes, I, I agree. Then the continuing education element, um, you know, I work very closely with a lot of state lawmakers where that that's a big part of my job is that education piece. Um, what do you need to learn? How can you learn it? You know, I'm not an engineer. I have degrees in communications and sociology. Like if I can learn how this stuff works, like everybody can. So I think that the, it's also, again, coming back to this piece of normalization, not treating digital equity, not treating um, broadband infrastructure as an other. Um, I would really like to spend another hour talking about sort of the structure of government and what happens in the CIO's office and the task force versus what happens in administration or in different agencies, but uh, that's not necessarily why we're here. So we'll see if we have time. Um, but I do want to come back to this question about measurement um, and the challenges with, um, you know, sustainability is um, really dependent on our ability to show outcomes. And um, output, measuring output is very important. You know, are we tracking against the, um, really the, the initial um, the initial goal set forth in legislation. So are we connecting people to the internet? Are we training them? Are we giving them devices? Okay, then what? And what we found in our research, which all of us know here, lawmakers are like, that's nice that you did that. That's great. You, you fulfilled the, the statutory requirements of connectivity and um, increasing access and availability of devices and training. But talk to me about what comes after that. What jobs did they get? Were they able to age in place? Um, this is hard to measure over time. Um, just to remind everybody, Karen's new book, two decades of research and, and data that they collected. So we know that data and demonstrating impact is going to be critical to sustainability of these programs moving forward, no matter where they live. So how do we balance that with needing sort of sh a short-term understanding of the impact of funds versus maybe the uh, reality that looking at things like community prosperity, that is a long-term analysis. So how do we navigate that tension? without it turning into a, a methods class? <laughs> oh, I, I can do it without a methods okay, class. All right, okay. So I think we need different kinds of um, feedback and evaluation. So certainly, you know, some of those outputs, you know, are people, um, you know, how many people got connected and so forth. Those are things that you can measure more through program data in the near term. And, and that's important, I think, to policy make. It's important for accountability <laughs> that, you know, that the program is, is um, actively being implemented. There's a role for looking at implementation, how effective the implementation seems to be, formative evaluations, and, and whether their, you know, um, programs need to be tweaked. Um, that's one level. Um, you know, ultimately, what we care about is even if a program was administered effectively, you know, what kind of long term impact it has. And we don't have enough of that research um, because there often isn't the funding for that. Um, I, we need to take advantage of some of the federal dollars to track over time the impacts that, that we see. This is an opportunity now. Communities need to invest in that. We actually, we need, so programs are going to differ uh, in one place compared to another. Um, there are going to be different approaches, different populations with different needs. Um, even if we, you know, even the smaller short 
long-term studies, in terms of um, things that might be more qualitative, you know, um, talking to participants or whatever, that still has value. Um, but I, I think that this is a moment, it's an opportunity with these kinds of investments that there needs to be some kind of concerted effort that, uh, you know, looking at programs, and it's not just up to local governments, I think there should be funding at the national level, from federal government, from foundations that care about this issue. There needs to be, there need to be some concerted efforts. There are all these experiments that are going to be going on now. We need to think about evaluation early so that we have baseline data and we can measure change. Um, while it's not perfect, we have some tools for doing that, that we didn't at the community level, that we didn't have during the broadband stimulus to be top during the Obama administration. The American Community Survey now gives us at least a few data points on devices, you know, whether somebody has a broadband subscription, um, it doesn't really tell us anything about skills, but it gives us some important pieces of information that we can look at over time. We have that data over time now down to the census tract level. Um, and so as these investments are made, we should turn to that data that's already out there. And, and, but you know, there's so many different ways you can measure impacts and for different communities. Um, but in, in general, there needs to be more evaluation. We often don't know much about what works and why. Um, and that's valuable even for the more short-term studies to see whether something seems to be working or not. Um, and then to also have the long-term impacts tracked too. Uh, I, I was just going to build on this this note of that Catherine said about highlighting outcomes and outputs and the just the challenge of measuring community prosperity. Um, I think it's just very something very difficult to define. And a lot of times, even you know, from a definition standpoint, there aren't people in these communities at the table to sort of share in that vision or that definition. So by even that, I, I think operation or movement forward, it misses the critical components of what success means to sort of legislators versus what that success actually looks like and means to community members. Um, you know, you know, I'll, I'll say in the historic work of uh, the I teams that are being run out of uh, the Bloomberg Center for Public Innovation, part of part of I think what we are we're only a center, we're only a year old, and I, I think that we have this ambitious vision of thinking through how can we use some of these innovation teams and other programs that are on the ground in cities and marry that with cutting edge academic research. So how do we look at things, measure things that actually have real time public impact? So I think that that's sort of the first answer, right? Is like testing these things out. Do they work? Do they not work? Uh, but I think the second and longer term, you know, answer is that there's been a lot of effort, I think, in cities looking at digital services and open data, um, but not a lot of work on aligning those points of progress with digital interventions um, and figure out, figuring out if we're sort of like helping or hurting in particular areas who are beneficiaries of these services. Um, and, 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 you know, are there byproducts of these services? Are people being harmed or being disadvantaged in some way uh, because of these interventions? And I, I don't know that we have enough data to sort of like sufficiently answer those questions. So I think the second and like longer term answer to this question is that I think that we need to actually change the metrics and we need to include communities in that decision-making process of what success means to them. Well, I think it also speaks to better defining roles for each level of government and, you know, what are they trying to, you know, what is the value add to them um, by investing in these programs and uh, what the value add is for a city may be similar to what a state sees or a federal agency sees, but they're going to look at different metrics. They're going to understand that problem and that, that challenge or the outcome, I think, differently. And um, I think you're both correct about the need for resetting our perspective on metrics, on the need for a national 
research agenda um, that can, I think, continue to push these conversations forward um, by demonstrating, one, I think it just shortens the learning curve. Um, the faster we can learn and probe on hypotheses, um, you know, the, the better we will be able to um, replicate successful projects across communities. But I also think too, it'll normalize what both of you were just talking about, which is that like, what is success for one community may not be the same success for their neighbor or for a, you know, a, a community just across the state line. That doesn't mean that another community elsewhere in the country doesn't want to learn from that or won't measure it in the same way. And even if they don't, that's okay. Because ultimately this is about serving the community. So it's okay, I think, I think we often, um, we look for that talking point, you know, the, the, big, the big number that shows the impact of these programs. And the reality is that we may not be able to tell the story of the impact of these investments, the outcomes um, in the big national numbers and the big transformational numbers, but where we may be able to see it is at the county level, the city level, at the neighborhood level. And ultimately, that's why we're doing the work. Um, so sorry, not to put words in either of your mouths, but I, I think that the this idea about thinking differently about how we measure the impacts of these programs, how we think about short, medium, and long-term evaluations, and who's responsible for doing it, um, is a conversation that I would love to continue, and I hope that the field um, continues it as well. Um, it's actually why we started an organization called Opportunity Broadband, and that wasn't a I, that wasn't a layup from Karen. Karen is uh, one of the professors who's graciously helping us as we think through some of these questions around evaluation, um, but. Um, I think that it's a, a conversation that the field needs to have in order to achieve sustainability. So in the last few minutes that we have, um, I think one, any closing points, but two, we have a diversity of practitioners on the line right now uh, from across the country, different roles, different organizations. Um, what's your call to action to them, to the people that are here? Um, what's your ask? What's your parting thought? Um, what's the need? I have to think about this one for a minute. <laughs> there. This, is a, this is a tall order and a lot of people. I know. Things I'm sorry. Up. No, it's okay. You know, I, I think that my, my ask of, of folks, you know, this is digital inclusion and equity is really at the heart of that. Um, and, and I think that we are advanced enough in this work to really start asking ourselves the question of like, are the sources of our data also sort of the same places where we're sourcing synthesis? Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think the ask of all of us is that, I, you know, I think that we need to diversify this field of practitioners to make sure that that synthesis and those data points um, are really, really a reflection of the needs of the communities that we serve. And so not only do, how do we incorporate folks into the, the research we're doing? How do we move beyond giving people gift cards for, you know, parts of their time, but really actually make them experts in their own right um, of their lives, of their neighborhoods and their communities? So I think that that would be my, my ask and sort of parting thought for folks in the audience. Karen? You, you muted yourself. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, I guess my ask is for local and state governments to think creatively about how to sustain this over time, to see it as part of standard operating procedures, as part of what they do, um, as part of what's necessary for innovation. Um, and and not to um, not to lose sight of the need for equitable um, technology use um, with the rush toward smart cities and all kinds of digital innovations. This is exciting, and there are so many opportunities there. But we want to make sure that we're not leaving, you know. Uh, some parts of our communities behind 
um, in, in the rush to innovate without thought, um, uh, or even, you know, as Malin mentioned, even causing harm, we need to think about, um, about the topic of digital equity in terms of everything that we do around technology and government. Thank you. Uh, so just to summarize our discussion today, um, what I've heard from both of y'all is that when we're thinking about the why, why does this matter, which is always where we're going to start when we're talking to anybody making decisions about funding. Um, when we're talking about the value of digital equity and the overlap with government services, this is about efficiency. It's about cost savings. Um, it's about access to government services. And it's about the outcomes. Um, it's about the impact that you know, it's ensuring that folks do have economic opportunity. They can access education. They can access all those civil services. Um, getting to that element of sustainability, what I heard from y'all was that um, we have to train people to talk about it. We have to train people to do it themselves. We need to be thinking about policy and how we fund it. And we need to be talking about research and evaluation, including maybe changing the way that we think about research and evaluation, um, recognizing that we need both short or we need short, medium and long-term um, understandings of how this is currently and will continue to affect uh, communities in the future, both positive and potentially negative side effects. What did I miss? I think that was a great synopsis. Thank you. Uh, we covered a lot. Um, so any other uh, parting um, words of wisdom, guidance, thoughts, anything you didn't get to um, add while we were discussing today? All right. Well, thank you both so much. Um, I would love to schedule a separate conversation so we can have a very wonky discussion about public administration and funding. Uh, so expect my email. Um, anybody else can join if they want. Uh, but thank you so much. Um, and uh, everybody enjoy the rest of the afternoon. And thank you so much for tuning in. Bye. Thanks, Catherine.